was a naval pilot, also uh, flew a variety of other aircraft, uh, retired from the Navy at duty in 77. Uh, and to uh, keep it brief, uh, he's obviously an aviation enthusiast. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. We'll be talking about the Langley this morning, of course, but also I want to talk about the remarkable men that got the Langley built and operational nearly 100 years ago. And while I'm at it, uh, I want to talk about San Diego being uh, it's known in some circles as the birthplace of naval aviation, and that's because way back in 1911, Glenn Curtis trained naval aviator number one here in San Diego, and over at what is now known as Navy North Island. And since 1924, beginning with the Langley, uh, Navy aircraft carriers have been part of the San Diego scene. So, uh, Dud is back there, the man behind the curtain, and he'll be running the slides, and here we go. Well, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. So here's a Langley. Yeah, that's probably, oh, there we go. All right, I want to talk a bit about it. Uh, that's the Langley up on top there, 1922, the cutting edge. It, w it was 11,500 pounds. 11,500, can you hear me? No. Okay, okay 11,500 pounds displacement, crew of 468, flight deck about 534 feet long. And I say about because different sources, reliable sources have different figures. And the speed was about 17 miles an hour on a very good day. And then 100 years later, it's a Gerald R. Ford, that's over 1,000 feet long, 4,500 crew members with uh, the air wing on board, four catapults, and that could do 30 plus knots. All right, so I'm going to be talking about how the aircraft carrier came about. Um, of course, the Navy was interested starting in 1911, and then they were mostly doing float planes and seaplanes, that type of thing. World War I came about, uh, U.S. Navy is over there in Europe, and they were doing mostly patrols with flying boats for submarines. The British, however, had a problem. The dirigibles were coming over from Germany, and they were bombing England at night, and also they were keeping track of the British fleet, the Royal Navy, in the North Sea. The flying boats that they had at the time could not engage the uh, Zeppelins because they didn't have the performance to climb up and do that. Oh, get over here. Okay, so the British had to take high-performance aircraft, what they considered high-performance aircraft at the time out to sea. And they did that by <laughs> putting these wooden flight decks, actually, over the turrets of these light cruisers, 22 light cruisers. And they put those wooden decks on there, and they put these little shop with camels and pups, and they would launch these things, and hopefully they could engage a, a, a dirigible or a zeppelin. Now, it was a one-way mission. The pilot took off, he would either land ashore or pitch at sea, and you can see a depiction of one right here. It's over the uh, gun turret, and this is what happened usually when the pilot came back. Okay, and this is this was the big problem. These Zeppelins were coming out of uh, different bases out of uh, occupied uh, Belgium and out of Germany, and they were keeping close tabs on the uh, Royal Navy, what they were doing in the uh, North Sea. Uh, no way to counter them because the, the flying boats weren't capable of doing it. So they started launching these airplanes to do that, these little uh, scout planes. Next, please. Okay, so the first recorded victory from a ship launch aircraft was in 1917, and it was with a softwood pup, took off off of the English cruiser, the Yarmouth. Uh, they had a Zeppelin that was snooping around the English fleet, <clears throat> and uh, this softwood came up, got in above it, attacked, firing tracer rounds, took two runs, but shot it down. So that was the first recorded victory from a ship launch aircraft. And he shot down the Zeppelin L-23. So we're moving on. There we go. So this is HMS Furious. Uh, some call it the first aircraft carrier. Uh, the, the English Royal Navy was trying to figure out how to get at the Germans. Uh, they, their airplanes didn't have the range to go over and attack the Zeppelin sheds. 
So they came up with this idea. And uh, they, at first they just had the port portion of that uh, ship with a uh, launching platform. And they would launch airplanes off that. And then they decided, well, you know, we're wasting a lot of airplanes because we launch an airplane, we never get it back. That's the ditch or land ashore. So they, so they developed that aft deck right there. And they thought that would be the answer. But it wasn't because, as any pilots in here can tell, Navy pilots in particular, when you're coming in for a landing on that aft deck, you have to contend with the stack gases and the turbulence created by the superstructure. So that didn't work at all. So they then reverted to just using the front portion of the ship, and they, they used this warship and the uh, uh, cruises, and they went over to the about 90, uh, 80, 90 miles off the coast of Germany, and they attacked the base at Torndern, where they had these Zeppelin ships. They launched at dawn, seven soft width camels, carrying two 50-pound bombs apiece, and they surprised the Germans, and they destroyed two Zeppelins. And this was the first carrier airstrike in history. So of those seven airplanes, five of them went to neutral Belgium, landed there, and two ditched alongside a destroyer expired of the fleet that went out. So after the Germans, the Germans were completely surprised. Uh, they didn't think the Brits could reach them. What they did after this happened is they moved that Zeppelin base further inland. Next, please. Okay, so the, during World War I, the Japanese and the Americans, of course, were allied with the British and the French. And they had observers over there, the Japanese and Americans, uh, observing what the, the British were doing with their um, airplane operations off ships. And they decided what they wanted to do is come up with some kind of a ship that could not only launch airplanes, but you could recover them as well. And America's answer was this one right here, the Langley. Next, please. Okay, here she is. Um, Langley started out as a Collier. Now, a Collier is a ship that was built, uh, this uh, one particular one, the Jupiter, was built in 1913, Mare Island Naval Shipyard, and it was basically they hauled coal around to the different ships in the fleet. A lot of the ships were coal fired back then. We get to a post-World War I period, the Navy wants to build an aircraft carrier. Um, basically, there's a lot of competition between the Army and the Navy for control of funding for aviation. That battle went on. Navy knew airplanes were essential, but not all the admirals in the Navy were convinced that uh, we needed an air aircraft carrier. Okay, please. All right, Naval Aviator number 16, this man right here, Kenneth Whiting. Uh, Forward thinking officer, he realized that we had to take advantage of the technologies of uh, airplanes, emerging technologies. He's quite, uh, quite a resume, I'll talk a little bit more about that a little later, but he's the uh, last aviator that was uh, trained by the Wright brothers, and he became Naval, Naval Aviator number 16. <laughs> I like this photo. <laughs> so he got a reputation. Um, he was a star athlete at the Naval Academy. And also, he was a submarine skipper, a very young submarine skipper over in the Philippines. And he was in command of a sub called the uh, USS uh, Porpoise. And six man crew, a very small submarine. So he had the idea that if a submarine went down, the crew could save themselves by going through the torpedo tube and swimming to the surface. So they go out on a routine mission one day with his crew, six men. They had no idea what's going to happen. They get out there, and Lieutenant Whiting says, I'm going out the sub through the torpedo tube. He climbs into the tube, they close the hatch behind him, open the outer doors of the torpedo tube, and he swims out of that thing. It takes him 77 seconds to get out. He gets to the surface, submarine comes up, climbs on board, said, ah, it's easy, no problem. He did not tell his superior officers he was going to do this. He reported that he had accomplished it after that. So he got a very good reputation. Okay, so fast forward, of World War I. Uh, he's now in the aviation branch one of the early aviators, and he's in command of the first aviation unit to be deployed to Europe. And he goes across the pond on the Jupiter. And that's uh, the ship right here, at the Collier. He notes as he's going across, he's thinking about, he's thinking ahead, he's noting that it has large cargo holes. And he's thinking, well, you know, we could use this ship, perhaps an airplane carrier in a future date. 
A little bit about the ship, you can see those derricks, and those were used to transfer coal from one ship to the other. Uh, very little superstructure once you get rid of all those derricks, and that's what exactly what they did. Uh, there was some uh, resistance within the Navy because the ship at that time was only about six or seven years old, and some of these uh, senior officers in the Navy wanted to keep it as a collier, uh, but they won that bureaucratic battle, and it was uh, eventually converted. Okay, this is the process of conversion right now. Uh, you can see what they took off the derricks, and they used the base of those derricks to build the uh, lattice work for the flight deck. And this is in June 1919, Congress had authorized the money. Again, there's still resistance within the Navy. The top admiral in the Navy uh, was dragging his feet, and it was still operating as a collier, but the Secretary of the Navy got involved in progress. They started doing this construction. So it became America's first carrier, went into Norfolk Naval Shipyard for conversion. Okay, please, next. Oh, is it? Okay. All right. Uh, you know, the, the uh, Jupiter was not ideal because it had very slow speed. It, it was, uh, you know, about 15 knots, could barely keep up with the fleet. Uh, usually that, in that day, battleships could do about 22 knots. This would do about 15. But it did have the advantage of very big cargo holes. It had six cargo holes and with huge hatches. So you could get airplanes in and out of there. So they could be re uh, reconfigured for workshops. Uh, one of the cargo holes, the Ford one, was for storage of aviation gasoline. Number four is where they put the elevator equipment. And the, the last four remaining holes were used for uh, airplane storage and workshops. And everything had to be adapted. Uh, this was, no one had ever done an aircraft carrier before. When this ship came into the shipyard, all the shipyard workers knew that they needed to build a flying platform off the top. Everything else had no idea what needed to be done. So they build as you go, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Next, please. Okay. This is Rear Admiral Jack Tate. I might add that a lot of these initial pilots that were on the Langley made senior rank. But anyway, he was talking about how the construction went, uh, on-the-spot adaptation. For example, with that flight deck up above, the center of gravity was much higher. So they had to figure out a way to deepen the draft. So what they did in those cargo holes, they poured uh, 10 feet of cement in the bottom of each cargo hole. That's how they did that. Uh, next, please. Uh, this photo was taken about 1926, I believe. 534 feet long, 64 feet wide. Uh, the Royal Navy at the time had a ship that looked very similar to this. It was called the Argus, and they had the same idea. Theirs was a converted ocean liner. Floating flight deck that went to sea. Floating airport. Next, please. This is a view of what the hangar deck looks like. So what they did, when they say the hangar deck, it was the original main deck of a ship, and they built that flight deck up above it. It was 30 feet above it. <laughs> and these airplanes are actually sitting on the top of the uh, coal hatches. Uh, what they would do is they would keep the airplanes, they start out with about 8 or 12 airplanes, they would keep them disassembled down in the cargo holes. And when they needed an airplane, they'd have this traveling crane, and it would crank up around and pick that airplane out of the hole, pull it up, bring it on to the hangar deck or the main deck, and they would assemble the airplane. Right there, you can see no wings on that. A very involved process, took a while. And let's see, uh, here, whoops, next one please, yeah. Okay, so this gives you a view about how involved this process was. First you gotta pull that airplane out of the hole, then you gotta assemble it, and then you gotta get it onto the elevator to get it up to the flight deck that's 30 feet above. But I want you to notice where that elevator is. That elevator is on the down position right now, still eight feet above the hangar deck. Mm -hmm. So now they have to take the airplane and they use these ramps, right there. They use these ramps and they get it on the elevator or they use a traveling crane up above, right over there, get it on the elevator and then they get it up top side to the flight deck. So that could take 12 to 15 minutes. And a little bit more about that later. Okay, 
So uh, there, you know, this is Langley is a big experiment. They want to figure out if they can actually uh, operate the aircraft off ships, and also they want to train uh, flight crew in that process as well. But if that experiment didn't work out, they're going to use the Langley as a seaplane tender, and they had two cranes on the hangar deck that they could hoist seaplanes out of the water, bring them up onto the Langley. And they also had to compress the catapult that they could launch the, air, the seaplanes off the bow. Next, please. Okay, here's a view. This particular seaplane, I believe it was called a Douglas DT-1, or whatever. It was a patrol torpedo bomber. And basically, uh, they made this airplane out of parts from airplanes from World War I, different parts, Liberty engine, this and that, and the other thing. But they actually had it on a trolley, and the trolley was connected to the catapult, and they would launch it that way at the end of the run. The trolley would release and off they go. Next. Okay. Uh, Question. Yeah, go ahead. Where are you? How did they control the airplanes on and off the runway? That's a good question. I'm going to get to that. You, you're talking about how they kept them on? Yeah. The, well, and the te I know I see no tower. <laughs> That's right. Uh, where where was the? Good question. What they did is they had steel nets on the side of the flight deck. Right. And they would just jump into those, and that's where they controlled it. Yeah, they, it wasn't very sophisticated. No, no radio. No. Nothing. Yeah. No. no. They had a lot of waving. And, and, yeah. yeah, waving and screaming yeah. and yelling. Yeah. <laughs> More about that a little later. <laughs> <laughs> they, go, go ahead, Bob. What's your question? Uh, where were they steering the ship from? I don't see any. Uh, well, kind if, of if, wheelhouse if we go back, uh, we'll see another photo of it. You look under the flight deck, and the original bridge of the ship is there you just can't see it and they would have to use messengers and everything it was it was really a bad situation yeah. as far as navigation but they managed to do it and uh, they actually sailed it up the Potomac River to Washington Navy Yard but a little bit more about that later but we'll see as we go along and next time I get a photo of the um, Langley, I'll, I'll point out where the bridge is and that's the wrong end yeah. <laughs> but anyway I want to point out a couple of things um, a lot of innovations. That there is a structure that's called the pigeon loft. A little bit more about that. That's the high tech com that they had back in those days. Smokestacks, usually in a vertical position, but during flight operations, they would lower them to horizontal so you won't get smoke over that flight deck. And that's an Aero Marine 39 coming in for a landing right there. But a couple of the other innovations they did, well, we'll, we'll get that in another slide. Please continue. Okay, so the Langley was named after just this gentleman right here. He was at one time a professor at the Naval Academy, an early aviation pioneer. He experimented with heavier than air aircraft, launched off barges in the Potomac River, <clears throat> Pierport Langley. And the Wright brothers were not too pleased when the Navy named the ship after him. <laughs> a lot of competition. Okay. <clears throat> So, a good view of the uh, hangar right there. Uh, you can see it's just nothing but a flat surface. And I can just barely see the bridge. You can hardly tell what the bow is, but Bob, there's the bridge right there. That's how they steered that thing. So, I imagine they had a lookout on the bow and he was screaming yeah. directions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this is at Norfolk Naval Yard. Uh, it, this ship was a technology demonstrator. Uh, they weren't sure it was going to work out, so they built it. They tried to build it on a cheap, which, you know, uh, Whiting, uh, Commander Whiting was the guy that was really the ramrod behind this whole thing. And he thought they could build it quickly, converting this collier, and cheaply. He was wrong on both counts. Uh, and with the Ford class aircraft carrier coming out right now, much the same way. Always costs more, always takes longer. So, but it was very effective as a floating test bit. They did very well with it on that. And I might add at this point, not only did they develop the techniques to launch and recover airplanes, but they trained the air crews for future generations of naval aviators. And flight deck crew, very important. Next one, please. This is the man called the father of the trap. And he was a young officer uh, attached to Langley. <coughs> It's not me. No. Hang on. So, uh, when they get started, the Navy back in, 
1922, they had 314 pilots, and they were mostly flying boat and float plane, float plane pilots. They did have a small cadre of pilots. Uh, they had eight battleships with these flying off platforms mounted over the turrets. Uh, during the Battle of Jutland, World War I, uh, the Royal Navy found out that the long-range artillery, they could do much better if they had an airplane, a spotter airplane up, calling the ball a shot. So th those eight battleships that the Navy had, they were uh, flying off uh, Newport 28 scout planes. And the same deal, they would take off, spot the fall of shot, and then either land ashore or ditch alongside a destroyer. Well, these pilots were the only wheeled pilots that you know, knew how to fly land planes in the Navy. There were about 15 of them, and they were kind of shanghaied into coming on board the uh, Langley. And uh, this gentleman right here was part of that initial cadre. So what they did, they did, had no idea how they did, well, they had a big idea, you know, uh, they had big idea what, what to do to stop an airplane once it got onto the flight deck. And uh, this man right here, uh, Mel Pride, uh, was an MIT graduate and a brilliant engineer. So uh, he, came, he was assigned the task of coming up with a, a system that worked. And we'll go to the next slide and you can read that. And uh, that was Chevy Chevalier came up and assigned him the work to do this. And he said, aye, aye, sir, I will do it. And the way they did it is they actually practiced ashore. Um, they basically laid out uh, the pattern of the flight deck and they practiced spot landings and then they worked, uh, they had a, a coal barge on the uh, Potomac and that had a, a, a wooden deck on it and they would do touch and goes landings on that. But someone asked about how they keep the airplane going straight. This is part of the deal right here. This is the axle and these uh, are anchor shaped hooks and I'll be talking a little bit more about that and just another slide or two. Next, please. Okay, so let's look at this. This is an Aeromarine 39B, and uh, this weighed about 2,000 pounds. It was not very fast. It was designed as a float plane, and basically a single float. They took the floats off. All these airplanes, the initial airplanes on the Langley were uh, modified aircraft. So they took the floats on, uh, they put uh, landing gear on, strengthened the landing gear. But I want to point out a few things right here. There are those hooks again, and they're going to be used to engage these wires called fore and aft wires. That's part of the resting gear system, no longer in use. The British were using that at the time, and they adopted that system, just part of it. That right there is called a hydro vane, and the purpose of that is the pilot, if the pilot had the ditch, that would keep the airplane from flipping over, they thought, they hoped. So that is the trailing hook. It's not a tail hook because these airplanes were very flimsy. So these are actually metal straps that go forward to the engine, rear engine mounts, and they attach to the rear engine mount. These airplanes are very fragile. Next, please. So the four, uh, the, uh, I talked about that uh, four and a half wires. Uh, the aft flight deck of the Langley, half 200 feet, they had these long wires that converged as they ran forward. The wires were about 10 inches off the flight deck, about a foot apart. And the idea was when the airplane settled down on the flight deck, those anchor shaped hooks would engage those wires. And it would uh, serve two purposes. They call them also alignment wires. Uh, these airplanes had no brakes. Uh, they had no way of controlling the direction once they slowed down. So and they, they landed about 40, 45 miles an hour, very slow. So those, once those wires were engaged by the anchor hooks, they would hope that they would run straight and true down the flight deck. Also, if there was a gust of wind, the airplane would pop back up in the air. Problem was this, you know, that friction is very far forward on the airplane and it would cause the airplanes to nose over. Okay. All right, this is the first guy that made a takeoff from the Langley, Squash Griffin. And uh, it was a process getting the airplane, again, they didn't have any brakes, so they had come up with a system that anchored the airplane to the flight deck, and they came up with an idea with, with the bomb shackle. They had a wire to a tie-down fitting on the flight deck. When he gave the signal and ready to go with the engine completely run up, uh, some crew member on the deck released that bomb shackle, and off he went. So he made the first takeoff in a biplane. Whoops, amazing. And this is the man that made the first landing, Chevy Chevalier. 
And the Naval Academy graduate, most of those guys were back in that day, uh, made the first landing off the Virginia Capes that Langley was sailing into the wind, 30 mile an hour wind, doing about six knots, and he came in, touched down at 45 miles an hour. Next one, please. And I guess we're going to see a video of it. So, in this somewhat skeptical atmosphere, the USS Langley CD-1 emerged. She was an experiment at first, a flight deck built on an obsolete Collier's hull, an Air Force sent out to sea. Lieutenant Commander Chevalier made the first landing on the Langley deck in 1922. For the next few years, Navy pilots and the Langley crew worked hard to master the complex techniques for handling both the carrier and her planes. they had cross deck wires that you're familiar with today on aircraft carriers. So they were trying out both systems. And they kept those alignment wires up until 1928. They actually put it on the next generation carrier, the Saratoga, before they finally got rid of them. But they did eventually. So while the Langley was in the shipyard undergoing conversion, uh, this gentleman made a big impact on Navy of Naval Aviation. He became head of the Bureau of Aeronautics. <laughs> So basically his job, this is Admiral Moffat, his job was to promote the interests of naval aviation within the Navy itself because there was still some resistance to aviation and more importantly before Congress and the, the American public. And he did an excellent job. And as one congressman said, his testimony before Congress was a masterpiece. So this guy was a savvy political player. Next please. And a good thing, too, because he was dealing with uh, General Billy Mitchell of the Army Air Service. So early 1921, uh, I think most of you are familiar with it, uh, they had these trials off the Virginia Capes where they sank these surplus warships. And uh, his contention, uh, Billy Mitchell argued that you really don't need capital ships in the Navy. All you have to do is buy squadrons of bombers, much cheaper. Uh, got the Navy's attention. Uh, the Navy wanted bigger carriers anyway. Let's go. Uh, this scene right here is actually in San Diego Harbor, and uh, they're launching a uh, looks like a Douglas torpedo bomber off the flight deck with a catapult. And they used to launch these airplanes when the ship was anchored ashore or docked ashore. Okay, so what the Navy really wanted was funding for the bigger carriers, and they were in the process of getting that. They they had two battle cruisers under construction. Saratoga and Lexington. And uh, Admiral Moffat was able to get Congress to authorize the conversion of these two battle cruisers into aircraft carriers. It's a good thing he was able to do that. Once these uh, ships came online, they were amazing ships because they're very fast. They were able to do 33 knots. Uh, they were heavily armed and they had uh, bigger flight decks, much more capable than the Langley was. Thanks. Here they are right here, and uh, Congress authorized the conversion. Uh, both were finally commissioned in 1927, uh, proved critical during the early days of World War II, Barrel of Coral Sea, Midway. Lucky we had these ships, and all their tactics, their techniques, the training of the, the air crews and the flight deck crews, basically that started with the Langley. I want to point out something now. The Navy during the, the 20s and 30s, they were beginning to experiment with 
getting these ships together as a task force during these fleet problems or exercises. So one of the problems the pilots had when these two ships were working together was figuring out which ship to land on because they looked identical from the air. So they came up with this idea right here. Put a black stripe on the Saratoga and cleared up the problem. Question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Both those ships have the real distinct uh, superstructure there. What is that? The, they, they call it the island. Yes. I mean, so, well, there's what looks like a conventional island, but then is it a Smokestack? Well, you know, that's, that's why they have the smokestack and the bridge, but also uh, when they converted these ships, there was still a thought that, you know, the cruisers, and they still have their armament. Uh, they have 8-inch guns on these things. These things were amongst the fastest ships in the world and the longest ships in the world. These are 8-inch guns. So the idea was if the airplanes couldn't fend off the enemy, they would fight them off with the 8-inch guns. So heavily armed, very fast, very capable ships. <laughs> So, but yes. You, you never see the uh, stacks like that again, you know, with, in the shrouds that you have. You know, yeah, yeah. I think part like of that. or something. Yeah, I think part of that reason because these things were battle cruisers right. and they were very powerful. I don't know how many boilers they had, okay. but it was yeah. it was trying to eliminate the stack gases. That, that's probably why they're so. I mean, right. that's my assumption. That's yeah. probably why they have those tall stacks on there. Yeah. <clears throat> but they they were fast because they had a lot of boilers. I think they had some like. Eight boilers, and they were amongst the fastest ships in the Navy. <clears throat> okay. All right. Oh. Okay. Um, covered wagon tours. Uh, so, you know, we got the conversion of these two battle cruisers started, and that's on the way. Uh, this right here is from a friend of mine who collects stamps, and um, he let me use this when I was doing the article. So, we're talking about. You know, the Langley was called the uh, covered wagon um, because that flight deck 30 feet above the main deck made it look like something very strange. Mm -hmm. Sailors didn't mind, call it the covered wagon, uh, much note these things. 14 useful years, this is 1936, and the mother of naval aviation. So after joining the fleet in 1923, they sent the Langley on tour for PR. She was starting her stuff. Okay, next slide, please. So Moffitt knew how to work the system, Admiral Moffitt. And, uh, you know, during the 20s, these were tough times with the budget. Uh, not much money available. The Army and the Navy were fighting for funding. And uh, Moffitt sensed that there was a wavering in official support for the continued conversion of these two battle cruisers because it's very, very expensive. So he decides to bring the Langley to uh, Washington, D.C., up to up the Potomac, Washington uh, Naval Yard, to kind of sway minds, and see she, she did do that. So they got up to Washington Navy Yard, and at the time it was the largest warship to go up the Potomac at the time. Tied it up to the yard up there, and they started flying the airplanes on and off. Plus they invited the public, and they invited politicians and officials and everything else, and everybody was just amazed just, just to watch these airplanes land and take off from the ship. And even President uh, uh, Harding came on board. He's the first president of the, of the country to ever visit an aircraft carrier. So uh, good ploy on, on Moffitt's part. Uh, the, Funding was assured, and they continued the conversion of those two battle cruisers. That's how it was done. Testing by trial and error. Well, we saw that film, and you could see how they were testing everything. And they were just developing the, the techniques for resting gear, for launching the airplanes. Uh, Mel Pride was the guy that was tasked with coming up with an efficient resting gear system. And they were also trying to, help, trying to figure out how to land the airplane on the carrier. Uh, every pilot had a different technique. Uh, the guy that did the best was Mel Pride. He flew a nose-high power-on turning approach, constant angle of attack approach, and he had the best landings, and his technique was adopted as standard. And then, of course, a new set of commands, heard on the ship, rig the deck, you know, get the, the resting gear ready, the catapult ready, pilots man your aircraft, and stand by to start your engines. Thanks, please. <laughs> okay, is this another video? Oh, uh, before you start, hang on. I think that's the bridge right there. You can see there's not much visibility, but that's where the bridge is. Okay, on the job training. Okay, let's watch this. 
All right, they're bringing down the, they had flag masts that retracted into the deck. There goes the funnels. Here we go again. And that was a good land. <laughs> All right, that's a Chevy Chevalier, yeah. Yeah. You can see those uh, axle hooks. Yeah, yeah. So they're learning as they go. I mean, these are the guys that wrote the textbook. So, uh, innovations on the Langley. Well, they did a number of things. Uh, they, when they commissioned the ship, uh, Kenneth Whiting, Commander Whiting, wasn't senior enough to be a captain in, of a ship in the Navy. So they had a non-aviator as the captain of the ship, and his name was uh, Captain Duffy. And uh, he wasn't even the president at the commissioning. Uh, Whiting was president at the commissioning, acting <laughs> as the commanding officer. But at any rate, um, Whiting had a number of innovations. One of them was a photo lab on the ship. He wanted to film every landing. That's why you were seeing these films right now. And uh, they did do that. They would develop the films, and they would buy us to look at them for lessons learned, what to do right next time. And I thought that was relatively recent, you know, the World War II stuff, but it goes back to the days of the Langley. Uh, and uh, while they were out at sea doing uh, landing practices, uh, Whiting would be back on the stern of the ship and be watching the landings coming in. And he would be moving all around, making hand gestures, arm gestures, uh, you know, basically body English about what to do, what corrections to make. And he didn't realize, but his pilots were noticing what he was doing. So everybody got together and they said, well, you know, maybe having an experienced man on the flight deck guiding us then would be a good idea. And that's how they came up with the landing singleman. And this is back in the 1920s. <coughs> okay, some ideas didn't fly. I was talking about that pigeon coop on the stern of the ship. Uh, World War I, they used uh, carrier pigeons quite a bit for communication. Uh, Navy flying boats would send these pigeons back to their bases with messages. Cross-country flights in the States back in the 20s before a uh, military aviator took off. Pilot would check into the pigeon quartermaster, get himself a crate of pigeons, and <laughs> off he would go. And if he came down in some farmer's field or wherever, he could send a message back to the base. Well, they tried this on the Langley. Uh, they were out at sea one day. And uh, the pigeon quartermaster decided that the pigeons needed exercises and they thought he'd, they'd fly around the ship and come back into the pigeon coop. He releases them and they fly around the ship three times and they head back to Norfolk, Virginia, where the, you know, where the ship was uh, converted and uh, they got a message from the base back there, come get your pigeon, basically. <laughs> and that was pretty much the end of it. They were evicted and it became the XO's quarters. Of course. <laughs> I don't know if he had to clean it when he moved in. <laughs> okay, okay, here, there it is. this is old sailors. Uh, I don't know how many were in the Navy, but sailors like to tell sea stories and here we are right here, so you can see the pigeon coop on the, on the stern. You know, matter of fact, uh, it, like I said, the Langley was the template, and they actually put a pigeon coop for a while in the Saratoga, along with those alignment marks. But they finally did away with that. Next, please. Okay, um, the first two years they didn't have any uh, squadrons assigned to the land because they're just trying to figure out how to work this thing. I mean, how are you going to get the airplanes uh, back on the deck? How are you going to get them below deck? Uh, how are you going to train the flight crews, the uh, flight deck crews? So, um, yeah. So it was just everything was just an experiment. So the first generation of carrier pilots, uh, they learned the hard way, a lot of crashes. Uh, bragging rights, uh, if you showed up at the old club with your face all smashed up, broken nose, you could say you on the Langley. They called it Langley face as well, instrument face, so you can read that. And these guys were tough guys. All right, next please. A bit about that, I saw a video where they were interviewing an admiral, um, and he was one of the original Langley pilots, and a lot of these guys during World War II made Admiral. They, 
So he was talking about instrument phase and you know what it took to become a Langley pilot. And landing, landings like you see right here, he called these a good landing because that's where the term originated. And any landing you can walk away from is a good landing. So that's where they started with that. Okay, next one, please. So this is San Diego. Oh yeah. And you probably recognize this to this day. Yeah. Up there. Yeah. And where it's tied up right there, they would actually uh, launch and land airplanes. Uh, they had to bow into the wind, and they would catapult them off. They would actually, they actually tried uh, night takeoff and landings, which surprised me. I thought that was something came much later. Okay, so no squadrons are, uh, uh, assigned until they get out to the west coast. And the first battle fleet exercise out here on the west coast, they, they have these two groups of fleets. Um, you know, blue and red, that type of thing. War games, and the fleet that had the Langley did much better. And the admirals took a lesson from this, and they was they started pounding tables. Said we want the Langley and the, I mean, I'm sorry, the uh, Lexington and Saratoga in the fleet right now. Navy's top admiral tried to accelerate the program. Also, they started thinking about purpose-built airplanes for these aircraft carriers. Next, please. This is the guy right here that is, uh, he's very big in uh, naval aviation. Uh, a couple of airfields named after him. Matter of fact, uh, Moffat has an airfield named after him, so there's Whiting down at Pensacola. But he came up with the idea that um, he was the head of the tactics department at the Naval War College in the early 1920s, and they were doing a lot of war games there. And he thought that, uh, you know, airplanes beyond their roles as uh, reconnaissance scouts and uh, spotting the follow shot, they would be very uh, useful as offensive weapons. So we started working with this idea. And uh, he gets assigned to the Langley as the commander aircraft carrier uh, battle fleet, aircraft squadron battle fleet out on the west coast. And basically, he's like a commodore of the, uh, above the Langley. Gets on board and starts. <coughs> You know, basically he's very quiet for a month, he's looking at operations, how they're working, the flight deck, that type of thing, doesn't say a word. And then he gathers all his officers together, and they call it the thousand and one questions, and he starts questioning them about how they're going to run a scouting line, how they're going to run an attack, that type of thing. So that's uh, Captain Joseph Bull Reeves, and by the way, uh, when the Jupiter came out of the yard in uh, Vallejo, California, uh, 1913, he was the first captain of the Jupiter. All right. So, uh, he reasoned that the more airplanes he had on the flight deck, the more punch he had for the carrier. So when he gets there, the Langley is only operating about eight airplanes. And that's because the officers on board the Langley uh, think that's the safest thing to do. They, they think any more airplanes you might run into problems. So, uh, he gets there and says, ah, this is not going to work. Um, he starts increasing the number of airplanes. And also he starts thinking about how can we get launch these airplanes quickly? How can we get more emissions out of these airplanes? So he finally gets it up to about, uh, depending on what you read, 36 to 42 airplanes. So that on the left there is what they started out with, and on the right is what he wound up with. So he did it by continuously drilling the, the flight deck crew. And the flight deck crew is very instrumental in getting a launch rate up. And he's most noted for increasing, speeding up the launch and recovery cycle. And a couple of ways they did it is they had these crew, the flight deck crew members uh, specialized jobs. Uh, different colored jerseys uh, designates a, a, a particular trade. Like the guys in blue would be working the, uh, the be muscling the airplanes around the deck. Guys in green would be catapult crew, arresting gear crew. Guys in uh, purple would be the guys that would fuel the airplane. So they just coordinated it on that flight deck. It was like a ballet out there, an airplane would land. They'd swarm it, get it ready to go again. And also develop hand signals, uh, because when all these airplanes are turning up, someone asked about communication. When all these airplanes are turning up, you can't hear anything. So they developed these hand signals, that some of them which are still in use today. Okay, another good view of Langley. Uh, there's the um, elevator. So when, uh, before Reeves got there, you know, but, you know, in their credit, uh, the, before Reeves got there, the crew of the Langley, they were just still trying to figure out how to get airplanes safely on the deck and off again without crashing. 
So he gets there and he sees what their technique is. What they would do is they had 8 to 12 airplanes. They would land an airplane, put it on the elevator, get it down below to the uh, hangar deck below. Which the British were doing the same thing and the Japanese were doing the same thing. Reeves looks like uh, this and said, this is not going to work if we're going to make this into a warship. So he, he's trying to figure out a way that they can increase the frequency. Good question. Go ahead. And that last slide, was that plane just landing? Are you heading for that hole in the deck? I, I hope not. <laughs> I, I would think that that's spotted right there. Yeah. I, I, you, know, you can see that the, the stacks are up. So I, I think he's uh, stationary in the water. Could you go back to the previous show uh, where you had all the airplanes on the deck? Okay. Could you back, go back one more? There we go. Okay. My question is the, uh, the carrier on the right. Yes. Is that just for display, or would they try to take off at the... No, uh, that is probably for display. Yeah. Uh, it would be a very short takeout front for the guys in the front. I wouldn't want to be one of the front runners on this situation. No, I understand. Uh, so, so, you would, you would have to be... You would have at least half the carrier deck available for takeoff and landing? I don't know for sure. I know they didn't take very much because when they would take off from those turrets, you know, the, the, the fly-off decks on the turrets, they could do it sometimes in 15, 20 feet. Right. Yeah. On the left there, there's a line across the deck. Could that be where it started? I don't know the answer to that question. Could very well be. Could very well be. One thing to remember is that these aircraft, their stall speed was about 40, 45 miles yeah. an hour. And this, uh, the Langley, uh, could hit, I think, 29 and a half knots. No, no, that was uh, Saratoga. Langley could hit, the, on a good day, 17 miles an hour. So if yeah. they're running into a 10 or 15 knot yeah. wind, you know, they yeah. don't need very much room to, yeah. to get the air. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but this is probably for display on the right hand side, but it, it has a purpose because we're going to talk about it in a couple more slides. Yeah. Uh, and they, I, I think we kind of, did we count about 35 airplanes on there? The, 36. 36? Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. They, they could all take off at once. Oh, they could try. <laughs> <laughs> These guys were good. Yeah, yeah. They were crazy. And they weren't afraid of crashing, apparently. Okay. All right, we're there. There. Okay, talk a little bit about this. Uh, we Laura earlier mentioned about how they were developing airplanes specifically for aircraft carrier operations. Um, Combat potential directly related to the sortie rate. Uh, Reeves was a big innovator in that. So they developed these airplanes. Um, one of them, Boeing aircraft, even back then, was big in fighter development, and this was a hot airplane, that one on the right. Uh, this came out about 1928. I'll talk a little bit more about that. They had an exercise in Hawaii where they attacked Pearl Harbor. And, uh, you know, traditionally, carrier airplanes have a high time connecting with land-based airplanes because of the additional structure for the tail hook and all that type of thing. This thing did very well. So, purpose-built for carrier duty. Uh, next, please. All right. So, how did uh, Reeves increase the, the takeoff landing cycle? Well, this is how we did it. The airplane would land. Those guys in blue shirts would move it to the bow of the ship. Next airplane would land and move the bow of the ship. The way they protected those airplanes on the bow is they put up this barrier. So if an airplane came in for a landing, missed uh, a wire, it would go into this barrier. It wouldn't go into the planes packed forward. Um, and they did this by trial, uh, trial and error too because they, you know, they tried moving the planes forward and having the guys come in for a landing. One guy came on in, missed the wire, just about took out the whole squadron on the bow. So then they said, hmm, well, maybe we better come. First, they tried these like Manila ropes across the deck, and then they finally came up with that. This is actually a carrier from the uh, sometimes in the 1950s, uh, any submarine carrier, I think. But you can't do a miss with that. That's right. That's absolutely right. But I think back in those days, those airplanes were very responsive. Um, I know that uh, during the Korean War, when the Navy first came out with jets, they had a really bad time because they were doing the same thing they had the straight deck carrier and they were trying to do the same thing they had a, and there was some doubt whether they could get jet aircraft on the aircraft carriers because they had a lot of accidents and you're right you can do a miss depending on where you were in the approach sure okay 
Okay, these are the typical aircraft on board the Langley. Uh, that Vought airplane there, uh, that was actually a training airplane, but it had pretty good performance. Uh, they, post World War One, there was a big order. Uh, the Naval Air Aircraft Factory and Vought Aircraft built about 128 of these things. So they were land airplanes converted for carrier use. Uh, they equipped the first Navy fighter squadron BF-2 aboard Langley. I think they could do 117 miles an hour. And then you got that Aero Marine 39B on the right there, top. Um, that was a float plane originally. They took the floats off. You can see the axle hooks. That's the radiator beneath the top wing. It was handy for the pilots to hang their, hang their jackets on to dry them out from whatever it. <laughs> then you got this Naval Aircraft Factory TS-1. That's the, that has the dis distinction of being the first uh, airplane designed for carrier duty. Uh, exercises with the Army out in Hawaii in 1927. The Army had no problems on dogfights with this airplane. They just humiliated the Navy pilots. And now we come up to the F-2B and I'll be talking about that here in the next slide. Next one, please. Uh, maybe not next slide. Okay, this is what we have out of Gillespie. Uh, I think there's only about four of these left, if I'm correct. Right, Tony? Yeah. yeah. Uh, one's at the Smithsonian. And uh, this, well, again, was one of the first uh, fighters designed for carrier duty. Um, they actually uh, started working on dive bombing techniques with this airplane, too, because it could go down on a straight dive and not have the leading edges of the wings fly off. Interesting story about this airplane. They build them up in the, in the Boeing factory in Seattle. Langley steams up there. Uh, and the Boeing factory is right near the water's edge. They put the airplanes on barges, 27 of them, barge them out to the Langley, haul them up in the flight deck, and from there they made their first flights in this airplane. Okay, very few of these remain. We do have one out at Gillespie. Next, please. All right. Um, okay, so now you can see the bridge. But... You know, when the Saratoga and the uh, Lexington came along, also they had the Hornet and the Ranger coming up on board, uh, Langley was kind of old news. So they, in 1936, they made the decision to convert it to a seaplane tender, and they completed the conversion in 1937, and it did duty out in the Atlantic and then out in the Pacific. And that's where she was when the war broke out in World War II. She was off the Philippines and she was serving as a mobile base for flying boat squadrons. Uh, war breaks out, she's near Manila, uh, makes her way down to Darwin, Australia, where she was flying any submarine patrols for the Australians. And then the war is going very badly to begin the war. The Japanese are rolling over everything. So the Allies are trying to hold on to Java. Dutch East Indies, which is today Indonesia. And they desperately need fighter planes, so the Langley's enlisted into that <coughs> effort, and uh, they load on 32 Army P-40s onto the flight deck. And she has an escort of a couple of destroyers, and off they go. They're heading out to a port in Java, Chilat Chap, I think that's what it is. So that morning, one morning, a Japanese reconnaissance airplane finds them. <coughs> of course, they want to go after any aircraft carrier. Uh, squadron of Japanese Betty Bombers show up, actually a couple of squadrons, and a bunch of Zero fighter planes, and they start attacking, and uh, the skipper of the Langley did a great job avoiding, I mean the ship was slow, it was top heavy with all those P-40s on the top, and, but he managed to avoid the first two attacks. On the third attack, the Japanese squadron commander just did a grid attack, he just dropped bombs all around the Langley, so whichever way she turned, she would run into a bomb, and she was hit by five bombs. Caused uh, all kinds of fires, uh, P-40s were on fire, they're pushing them over the side. They had very little in the way of any aircraft guns. They had a couple of 50 calibers, they had the bar automatic rifles, but they, they fought the ship well, they did a good job. Tried to get it into port, uh, then the engine room flooded, and that was pretty much all she wrote. <laughs> Escorting destroyers uh, scuttled her with gunfire and torpedoes. So here's a picture of the Langley taking a torpedo, <clears throat> and that's the crew of the Langley right there. They're watching their ship go down. Might add that a lot of these folks that you see in that photo probably didn't survive the war because they got onto a 
a tanker called the Picos and a destroyer, and a couple of days later, those vessels were sunk by the Japanese as well. Very few survived. Also, I might add that on the Langley, besides those P-40s, there were about 33 Army Air Force pilots and mechanics, 12 mechanics. And one interesting thing I noted about those pilots, I think the only one of them had uh, some experience in the P-40. The other guys had no experience whatsoever, but that's how disparate they were. They were going to send these airplanes over, put these guys in, and said, have a good day. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Okay, today she's on the bottom of the Java Sea, about 74 miles off the coast, and her legacy endures. Next. And that's it. That's what we have today. And next slide, please. The cat says we're done, unless you have questions. Yeah. In the basement, we have an original Langley Donald Duck cat hmm. with the flash around it with USS Langley. Yeah, wow. It's one of the rarest things we have in yeah. the Yeah. I know that on the Midway, they have a lot of the letters from crews and photos and that type of thing. It's fascinating. Uh, these guys did a wonderful job. And that's all, folks, unless you have more questions. Okay, please, go ahead. Do you have uh, any history about the angle flight uh, landing deck? Uh, yes, I can speak about that a bit. Uh, that came up, it was actually a British innovation. And uh, it came up, uh, like the Midway, for example, it went in for conversion, uh, USS Midway, 1955. But we were talking earlier about the Korean War and how the jets were, the Navy was having a hard time being, and that's why they didn't have swept wing aircraft for the Navy during the Korean War. They were just too fast to land on the carriers. So they, uh, they, they came up, the Brits came up with that angled deck innovation, plus they came up with the optical landing system and the steam catapult. The British really did a lot. So they came up with the angled deck system so that an airplane on approach, if, he, if it was going badly, he could go around again. If that, did I answer your question about the angle deck? Uh, yeah, who, who was, who, anybody in particular? Or just, uh, I, I, you know, I don't know who in particular. I know it was the British that came up with the idea first. The Americans saw it. They liked what they saw. They started converting um, Essex class carriers in the Midway class. And they converted all of the, the, the Midway. It was three, three aircraft carriers, the Roosevelt, Coral Sea, and the Midway. And they converted all three of those. And that's why they were still in operation years and years later. Okay. I, I have an image of somebody waking up in the morning and say, You know, I imagine that what, exactly what happened. I mean, you know, they, I, I read about how they came up with the optical landing system, very, very primitive. And, and the Royal Navy came up with the idea, but then, then the Americans got a hold of it and they, they refined it. So it just one idea on top of another, you know, until it gets better. How about the jump deck? The jump deck, you mean where they jump into the, oh, that thing? Yeah. You know, I don't know much about that. I do know that um, the Chinese... British. Was that British? Yes, yeah. and that was for the Harrier Jump. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the, the problem with that, from what I've read, I'm not an authority on it, but the problem with that is they can't really carry much of a load when they do that. Right. And that's what the Chinese are doing now. And the Chinese are building warships right now, if they haven't already, with uh, catapults. Okay. Which ones are... are which? Point out the catapults. What's that? Which one, What are the catapults? Which ones are they? Well, like, you see those white stripes? Two on the front, one on the right. Two on the right. One, two, three, four. This is a four. They're electromagnetic. Well, so, but why are they... They're three face the same direction and one face a different direction. Yeah, well, uh, you know, basically, they did, when they operate an aircraft carrier, they launch the airplanes and then they bring them for landing. Apparently, this is a, a carrier that they can do both simultaneously, but they don't normally do that normal operations. So which one is the landing deck? Oh, right, right here. That's the angle deck. That's the landing. That's yeah, the landing. yeah. You see that yellow and white stripe? That's the center of the landing area. The ladders are the safety zones. And that's what makes it difficult for a carrier pilot, is because they have to make a continual turn as they're coming in. Exactly. You always, you always bear them off to the right. Yeah. Particularly on the midway, because it had a 13-degree angle deck, which is... Most of them today have nine degrees, but um, so what, well, so you're but you're turning left coming in. But you have to angle to the. I don't quite understand why. Well, the, right you on. know, the, 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 you know, you, you keep on having to line up with that angle deck. I, I, when I went through, I was just taught. You know, I didn't go into the science very much, but I just knew what I had to do, and I had to keep that center line in front of me, and I did whatever I needed to do. I mean, it's like second nature after a while, but you do have to correct for that deck as it. So when they're launching, yeah. they can be launching, well, 
at least three at a time. No, they wouldn't do that. No, no. They would launch, the primary launch would be right here. Uh, this, I, you know, I don't, you know, I'm not familiar with the Ford class. Uh, this could be backup, you know, in case these mechanically go down. But I don't think they would be, you know, maybe they could do one, two, three that way there. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not sure how they would work that. I, I know they have the capability, but whether they would do it or not, whether it made sense or not, I don't know. There always the issue with the Corsair landing on the carrier. Yes. The Corsair. Yeah. Well, the Corsair, again, uh, and it was with the early airplanes as well. Uh, I forgot to mention that when they were flying these early biplanes onto the carriers, they had what they would call the two, three, and four cushion men. Basically, then how tall you were. So when they were coming in for a landing, uh, <laughs> they would have to be high in the seat so they could see over the nose to see the carrier. Now, the Corsair, same deal. When they came on on that, and it was again, it was the Royal Navy that figured out how to land these Corsairs on carriers. They did a constant turning approach until the very last second, and then they popped it down on the deck. If you look at the Corsair that we have in the museum here, long nose, so it, they were constantly turning. They could keep the deck in sight, and that was one of the big problems. Uh, the Navy had a squadron of Corsairs, land based, and the Marines, of course, did it. But it took them a while, and again, it was the British that figured out how to land the Corsair on those small carriers they had. And so just a constant radius turn, yeah, coming yeah. In versus it, a I stabilized think. approach. Yeah, right? yeah, until the very last minute, and then you plop it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how they did it. Any more questions? Hey Bob, with all the tradition there is in the Navy, how come they've never named another carrier after the language? You know? They did. They did, yeah. It was in World War II, and it got hit by a kamikaze. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. It was. I think it was. It was called a CL. Not quite an escort carrier. It was light. like a light carrier. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, whether they do now, they name all the ships after politicians, but they used to name them after heroes and sailors and that type of thing. But uh, yeah, they did have a Langley during World War II, and I'm not sure they might have an auxiliary like a tanker or something named after the Langley right now. But yeah, they had uh, Langley during World War II. That it. All right. Thanks, well, guys.